Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody inside and outside the ballpark. My name is Noved Player, and welcome to episode 22 of the Noved Notes podcast, where we talk about many different types of creators, avatar creators, world creators, asset builders, community representatives, and many amazing people inside of the platform. And today, I'm here with one of the founders of a roleplay community called, I'm probably going to butcher the name off rip, but that's okay, Tuatha De Danan, uh, Miss Rain. Rain, welcome to the podcast. How bad was the butchering? Um, I think I'll just summarize it with my pronunciation. Tuatha uh, De Danan. Fuck. Okay. Say, 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 yeah, say, yeah. say, say it one more time. <laughs> Uh, Tuifa de Danan. It's very softy. Ah, very okay. softy. Well, anyways, uh, <laughs> my bad pronunciation aside, because I am uh, uncultured. Uh, so, for the general listening audience, kind of you know, give a brief explanation of you know what exactly is uh, Tuifa de Danan. I probably butchered that again, but it's gonna happen. Yeah, no, well, so the way for the nun is, an, in the quickest way I can summarize it, an alternate history cyberpunk fantasy uh, RP. And the main premise behind it is that, like, uh, in the year 1981, magic sort of, like, returned to the universe and all that stuff. And... You know, that kind of caused a whole butterfly effect worth of effects to happen. You know, certain wars were fought in different ways, certain uh, countries rose and fell. But the main thing to focus on is 1991, the Dublin Decimation, which was an event where there are a variety of rumors as to how it happened. But the main consensus is a big magical sphere consumed the entire Irish county of Dublin, not just the city, but the whole county, and basically swallowed it up, essentially turning it into some sort of magical Chernobyl. And all the residents were just disappear. No one knows where they went, but they're all presumed dead. And as a result, mages, people who could cast magic, were sort of like uh, hunted down, cast aside, uh, forcefully conscripted into several like corporations or militaries, etc. Oh wait, I forgot another thing. When magic came back to the world in 1981, it also meant that like fantasy races came back too. Like elves, orcs, trolls, goblins, halflings, uh, nekos, kitsunes, etc., etc. Um, back up, getting back on track. Um, fast forward to 2034, and there's this little cafe in Ireland, in its new capital city of Archmouth in County Mayo. And in this cafe, uh, there's a secret group of mages that essentially just, uh, well, when they're not serving coffee to people, they're looking for magical artifacts, they're fighting rogue evil mages or other such weird entities, or currently, they're fighting an evil cult, uh, trying to stop them from summoning an eldritch uh, deity into the world and stuff. Wow. That's the most basicest of basic premise I can give. No. I could literally go on for longer. Fair enough. Wow, that... that... That was a lot. <laughs> so let's kind of get into it, right? That, that, that's a simple one. <laughs> Fair enough. So with that, you know, um, so what made you want to create, you know, this role play community in the first place? So this is going to sound a bit sus at first, but just trust me here. It started mostly out of anger, uh, in a sense. I, I had gotten into VR to role playing about a year and three, four months ago. Started with started with the started with Dimensional Postal Service. Then I was on the LPD. Then I was on Waifuware. Then I joined Kocho, uh, uh, you know, uh, Yuki and stuff, and Ginger. Uh, and the thing was, I found out about like you know that there were magical based uh communities also. Some of them were metaverse. Some of them were closed universe, etc. But the one thing that was common about all of them, which I absolutely was kind of angry about at the time, was all American timed. And at the time, I wasn't good at typing really fast on the chat box in VR chat, so going there mute was a no go for me. Uh, so I just broke down one day and I was like, "Fuck it!" And I wrote up an eight-page long Google document about like some random alternate history world heavily inspired by Shadowrun, D D, Cyberpunk, all sorts of other stuff too. Tiny bit of Shin Megami Tensei thrown in actually, uh, and Persona too. Uh and I just 
spent the next few months like kind of trying to figure out where to actually organize these notes and boom. Play for Anon was born. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I'll say it does seem like there's a lot of more North American based, you know, role play groups. Um, which is unfortunate because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, outside of North America, you know, communities and stuff and people who want to do stuff like that. So I definitely understand, at least on that point. Um, so I guess one of my questions is, you know, just to kind of go even further back, you know, before you started the role play community, you know, what what essentially drove you to play VR chat in the first place? This is going to be the most common answer you will hear. I know that for a fact, but it was a Uganda knuckles. It was. I'm like, going go, to have, like to, I'm gonna have to make a counter gonna... for every episode that someone says Uganda knuckles. I'm going to have to make a counter and just some, put it somewhere in the corner. I'm not doing it now. Maybe on the new year's review, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, like, like, like a year in review sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, because, like, I remember in 20, like, like this is 2018, like, I I was still pretty much an egg back then, you know, like, I'm, I, I was in VR chat. Uh, as far as it was desktop at my cousin's house, because he had an actual PC and I didn't. Then in 2019, I got my own Quest headset with an old account I no longer have access to, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then I, I was on Quest for years. Then 2021, I got a PC. That's when the eggshell cracked, and I became the woman you see in front of you today. And the VTuber too, not, not uh, that too. No, no, wait, the VTuber bit was 2022. I w it was a year of me just being a, an eggshell cracking and then VTubing. But yeah, just yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. So you know, out of out of curiosity, um, so you know, with it being a fantasy, you know. Oh my gosh, there was so much in that description. I'm trying to gather it all. So it's essentially like a fantasy, sci-fi, metaverse role play, to put it shortly. Not meta. Not metaverse, kind of. Uh, although we do have partnerships, although we have partnered with Tagar with Tagari Termini, and have a small link to metaverse via one character that got accepted. We are not officially a metaverse community. We're still, we're still very much closed universe. Though mm. with that tied to Togar Termini, if somebody wanted to bring in a character from another universe in, there would be some quite a bit of back and forth discussion, a bit more than usual between the staff and this and this character. Uh, I mean, and the user behind the character and such. But ordinarily, we are not metaverse. We're very much closed universe in a sense, gotcha. except for that tiny tie to Togar Termini. Fair. Fair enough. So, you know, in th in that case, like, so let's kind of deep dive in, in, in a little bit more into the role play itself. So how how does one um, how does one overview in like an event, you know, with your community? Like how how exactly does your role play work, essentially? Uh, very similar to how communities like uh, Kocho, Naokaza and Blue Star might do it. We're very mission-based in a sense, where at the beginning of each week or on Sunday, if the week is that full ahead of time, we'll post a schedule with, you know, what's going to be, you know, happening this week, at what time, a little description of what's going on, maybe the difficulty if it's relevant, you know? Like, we actually assigned color squares on the, on the schedule, so like green for easy, orange for medium, uh, red for hard, and although we haven't done a lethal mission yet, white square for lethal. <laughs> Oh, so kind of explain what 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 entails like a hard mission versus a lethal mission. Um, I'm not gonna say much about lethal because we haven't actually done much discussion in the background about how lethal missions should work. But for hard, um, to explain hard, let me explain a very basic rule distinction between hard and medium or easy. Sure. In easy and medium difficulties, see players have about six hit points. Uh, four if they're playing as a non-magical user, a mundane. Uh, and if they were to reach zero hit points on easy or medium, the character would just be not unconscious, right there on the spot, you know? Like a nice little cartoon frying pan to the head type trick. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're playing on hard difficulty events, like one we held a few days ago in that one uh, Dojima family map, I'm not sure if you've seen the one, it's really cool. They like, ripped it right from Yakuza the Year, but uh, anyways, uh, we were doing an event there. And at least twice during the event, 
two of our players uh, got knocked down to zero hit points on hard. And the way we have it is that, much like Call of Duty Zombies, for example, <laughs> we have a one minute bleed out timer. Uh, one minute is, it sounds like a long time, but when you're in the middle of a combat session, it isn't. I mean, like, when one character was about to be healed, because, uh, like, to get off the bleed out timer, you had to be healed by someone, either a basic, like, patch up with, like, I don't know, ripped up clothing, or using a healing spell or crystal. You know, that'll get you out of, like, bleed out timer. But one guy was, like, five seconds away from death, like, by the time our guy, by the time the, the, the team's healer got to him. It was so close, but the players absolutely loved it. It, it really, because, like, they were really playing things intelligently because they were sneaking into a mage hunter hideout in order to uh, rescue a friend of theirs and fellow ally who had been kidnapped and sold off to them uh, and such. So fighting through a bunch of people with baseball bats, guns, bare hands. One guy had a shotgun at some point and another guy pulled out rebar from the wall and used it as a giant sledgehammer. It was thrilling. They even fought a corporate trained mage at the end that was dressed up like Michael Jackson or something. I'll show you the avatar after the interview. It's so cool looking. It's just really, it was super menacing. And we even had like a uh, boss music uh, from Shin Megami Tensei Five actually for it, uh, using uh, the Demi Fiends theme from the DLC. If any of you here have also played uh, that, I thank you very much. Um, <laughs> oh, that's tangent number one. That's tangent number one. <laughs> it's all good. So, yeah, no, it's definitely definitely an interesting way to go about it. You know, uh, I'll say with, there's a lot of mission-based uh, role-play styles and totally, totally respectable, to say the least, um, because every community does theirs a little bit different. Um, so I was going to say in that regard, right? So kind of... To, to deep dive more into the event side, kind of give like an example of an event you've held, you know, just so that the listening audience can kind of like get a visual, mental visual or visual. If there's videos, I'll throw it up on the screen. But um, just kind of like a um, like a debrief of what an event would look like or what would what would it be like? Give me a brief moment while I pick an event. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All good. Uh... Because one of our server members frequently likes, frequently likes to record their events from their point of view. I'm going to DM you one particular one, and then I'm going to read uh, straight from the report with some paraphrasing just to shorten it down a bit sure. of how it goes and such. I'll just DM it to you. Let me just find the event report really quickly. Um, um, uh, let's see, where is it? Event report. Uh, there it is. So there was this one event. It was called A Walk in the Park. Okay. So, basically, the players, uh, okay, so, bit of context. There's this other faction of mages that exists with, well, there's two other factions that I need to bring up. There are the druids, which we, which the players are currently allied with, thanks to them helping them out in several occasions in the past. The druids are, well, they're druids. They hang out in nature, they, their patron deity is Gaia, and meanwhile, the Twayfa Technon's patron deity is Danu, from Celtic Mythology. Uh, and such, and the druids basically were busy holding like a big commune of some kind, like a big meeting. So they needed the players to investigate a cursed forest for them and such. Understand why the forest suddenly had a bunch of evil dark magic emanating from it when it usually didn't, as that forest was the location of their previous grove and such. So the players, uh, instead of taking the players straight to the forest to investigate, we actually took them to another map first, uh, one of the Trails of Cold Steel maps. I forgot what the map is called, but like it's it's like a small town. Uh, it looks European enough. Uh, the players were sent out to get some camping supplies, get some bread, get some other such materials too. I think one of them had to get like a, a life straw also. Yeah, uh, five life straws because you know they're going into the woods and not all the water is clean. So you get me? <laughs> sure. We yeah. We, we had several NPCs in the event. Uh, we basically limited how many players could be in it, so that way we could make the town and the vill we could make the village seem more lively. Like for example, I had this one uh, shopkeeper. It was like a small kitsune woman, no taller than like four foot five, running it. Strong Irish accents, like somewhere on the lines of, uh, "Oh, welcome to my shop. I'm gonna help you up there today. Oh, do you want some uh, camping supplies or that cheap? Yeah, <laughs> probably more than you do. Yeah, stuff like that. Uh, and you know, after the players gathered supplies and stuff, um, 
they had to meet the informant, or in this case, the tour guide to the forest, more or less. Uh, but it was very interesting, because the druid, the druid that they were meeting with didn't show up as themselves. They showed up as a crow, <laughs> because druids can wild shape in the setting, much like uh, how they can in D&D and other such places. So this crow just approaches the players while they're feeding, while they're doing a blood rotation with a rat. I cannot get the context of this. I do not know why they're doing a blood rotation with a rat. Um, it, like, I think it started with like an elf gilf, and then a small cat boy, and then like somebody else. But like, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I know. That's a sentence and a half. <laughs> but, you know, they see the bird. They see the bird. <laughs> the bird starts cawing at them like, caw, caw, caw. And so they start following the bird. And eventually, once they find a nice spot out of town, the bird transforms into like a young elf woman, and not used to you know flying around and being so tiny and having vision wider than the average human, she vomits. Understandably, because realistically speaking, if you're wild shaping for the first time or something, and you're not used to bird vision, <laughs> that's gotta be like super nauseating, right? Mm. And so. After that, we do, we take them to the forest, have a quick four or five day time skip, and we do some rolls with some dice. As in, I had a blue dice and a red dice in my room, rolled it on a tray, asked the player to pick a dice, and that was the result. Basically, the idea was that, you know, they've been in the forest for about five days now, four nights exactly. So, there were four clues to gather, in, in a sense. About, no, sorry, five clues, because, like, the fifth clue was the morning. Four of the clues were rolled out successfully, and the fifth one did didn't, which I'm actually glad it didn't, because it was the most obvious clue as to what was going on in the forest, actually. Uh, like, for example, um, bears clawed to death by strange wounds that don't resemble animals, or strange glowing crystals where they shouldn't be, or a mysterious feeling that you're being watched, even though it's very clear that nothing is nearby, or just, I don't know, uh, the druid taking care of your camp, coming back looking a little more sus than usual, you know? The players do some investigating in the forest, you know, uh, the druid maintaining the campsite. They come across some wolves, and they feed them some berries. It was actually the Minecraft fox model that we that, that we found on Avatar Search, and then just applied the gray skin onto it to make it look like a wolf. It was like, hey, hey, berries, berries. <laughs> yeah, yeah some, somebody actually drew art of, like, uh, one of the player characters feeding uh, the wolves. It was very cute, very cute. Um, and then they found some hikers. Then they uh, manage to get a bear away from another hiker, who turns out the like hiker, I think, stole like some food or something by accident. One of the players like cast comprehend languages, so that way they can understand the bear. Another player uh, shot a magical bolt at like some glowing dark magic crystals, and it just blew up because all that magic came out at once. They even came across some of uh, some. They even came across some test subjects from an evil cult that they managed to free a while back in the forest, that are now roaming around as a wandering tribe. Uh, I'll explain what those are later, but after all that was gathered, they received a message on Ascending Stone to head back to camp, but what was strange is that the druid, they seemed erratic, they seemed scared, alone, and they weren't speaking English. And it wasn't elvish they were speaking even, because yeah, we do have sometimes NPCs have speak different fantasy languages, but we don't have any hard-coded words or languages we're not token we just have sounds you know so like elvis should be like you know, that'd be an example of elvis right there no the language this person was speaking would more be uh, what, what's the word eldritch so it was like stuff like that you know very spooky when seen from behind. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm very good at mouth sounds. Yeah, <laughs> Language is just mouth sounds after all, given I, meaning. I'm, not, so, I'm not translating that, post the, editor. The, you, no. <laughs> yeah, no. You're not. You're not getting a translation either. <laughs> you. You won't. Um, I don't think you can show the captions on YouTube. <laughs> um, and so, like, the, see, the seated druid is all shaking and convulsing. All of a sudden, a bunch of purple smoke comes out behind them. Showing that, oh no, they're possessed, and the boss fight begins, and it's super scary and stuff. Uh, we played a, and we played the boss music from Persona 5, Blooming Villain for that one. Super mm. scary and stuff. So the players are fighting it. The, eventually the druid is knocked down, 
But because of that, the possession, you know, the, the spirit possessing it, finally managed to leech off enough energy from the druid to gain physical form, thus rotting away the organs of the druid in the process, because that's sort of like how possession in that context can work sometimes. Very one-sided at times. So they end up fighting a Dead by Daylight killer with like a nature skin on it as the boss, because we didn't have time to make our own, so we just like went to Avatar Sword Shield. Okay, yeah, sure. That looks good. That looks good. But that that works just right, because Avatar Search is like our best friend here at times. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes it already has music, you know? And so they fight it, and eventually, like, I think somebody else tagged into the boss fight too. I don't remember. It's been like, I think like two or three months since we ran that event. Uh, after the boss has ended, the dark curse on the forest is lifted, and a druid and the arch druid, as in the leader of the druids, hops on by to congratulate the players and mourn the loss of the of the other druid who lost her life trying to protect the forest and such. So as I pass at a cafe, they have some coffee. Event ends and such. Gotcha. That's definitely. Man, I hope there's some good footage on that because that that was a that was a journey and a half just listening to it. Um, <laughs> but... I mean, one of our other events, some of our other events can be as simple as just doing a shift at the cafe, or what we're gonna do uh, this Wednesday, DoorDash delivery. Only we don't have a car. <laughs> oh no! Oh, oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> so, out, out of curiosity, yeah. like. So just to kind of dive back a little bit, um, so what what made you come up with the name? Uh, I'm gonna butcher it. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher it every time. Comment section. I I know. To, okay, so it's Twitha de Danan, correct? Close. Twitha de Danan. Say it one more time. Twitha de Danan. Twitha de Danan. Close enough. Close That's enough. an acceptable level of pronunciation. Close uh, enough. I, I give you the pass as an Irish person. <laughs> hell yeah. So, okay, what what made you come up with the name of, you know, the roleplay and et cetera, is what I was trying to say. Um, okay, so this is going to sound completely out of left field, but have you heard the YouTube channel uh, Overly Sarcastic Productions? I've heard of it, yes. Yeah, well, I was watching one of their videos they did on Irish mythology, particularly the one, the one where they covered the Book of Invasions, uh, which is a whole ass Irish myth talking about the various times Ireland's been invaded in, like, mythological history and such. Uh, and it's essentially a main, like, the main group of gods and goddesses uh, and other such deities in Irish lore are the Tuifa de Nan. There are a million pronunciations for them, but this is the one I'm using for them, because I hear this one used the most in museums. Uh, so I'm just like, because eh. as you know, because as you may or may not know, Irish, the Irish language is not one unified language. It has several dialects. And so, like, it might be spelled one way, but it'll got like a million, bazingle, more billion different like pronunciations to it. And, you know, since since the group of Celtic gods is known as the Tuifidid Nan, and since the RP is set in Ireland with a group of mages, and since the patron deity of the organization is Danu, who is like a nature goddess and I think also the leader of the of the organ of the you know pantheon, it just clicked. Fair enough. Yes, yeah, so I was saying. Granted, <laughs> Go ahead. it's a lot more smoother of a name than the one I had originally planned for it, because I originally planned to give it a video game type of title. I think the name I had originally planned for it uh, was, oh, what was it? It was, got it. It was Modern Reincarnation of the Celtic Pantheon Rebirth. That... Toy for Now is a much better, much better title than that Shin Megami Tensei ass sounding word. Yeah, I would say that is a, it's a, it rolls, I'm not even going to try to say it again. It rolls off the tongue better than the, the, the video game version. Um, yeah, yeah. So speaking speaking of which, so I as a uh, you know there was some small research I did before the episode. Um, you know, let's talk about like how um, certain roles are into play. So um, obviously, there's like the main founder, then there's the second in command. I'm I'm not even gonna you're gonna have to say them because I'm gonna butcher the names like absolute hell, and I'm gonna get roasted in my comment section. But so kind of let, let me open let me 
Let me open the, the, the VRC Legends page so I can get this with you too. Hold on. So the names of the hierarchy. Um, I don't blame you. These are hard to pronounce. So for leadership, we have the Tiana de Danu, which I think is like Lord Lady of Danu, you know? Mm -hmm. Then there's Kantaka the Danu. Notice how the C is at the back of the throat there. Kantaka the Danu, which mm -hmm. is pretty much, uh, I think it's either warrior or champion of Danu. I think that's it. It's been a while since I love the translations. Like, those are the leadership roles. Uh, I'm the Tiana the Danu of the group. Uh, Sammy, uh, 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 nice, nice, nice good friend of mine. Uh, they're the Kantaka the Danu of the group, the second in command. Then we have our Archmages, which currently consist of uh, the Potato King. Then we have our Grand Mages, which consist of Cappy and Karasanto, and such. And then below that, we have all the player ranks. Fair enough. So, just to kind of deep dive into them, you know, what what are some of the key factors that, that determine these roles? So, let's start actually from the bottom and work our way up to the top. So... Uh, so for the player ranks, we have the initiate. So I know, actually, no, actually, even below customer. When you first join the server, and you're proven to not be a bot, which is very simple, just don't be a bot. <laughs> um, you're manually given the customer role by one of our staff, and basically, customer they can access the more general channels, like the, some of the VCs. They can even see the event pictures and beer chat photos and memes and such, and the announcements. Basically. It's the server is basically a hangout server for them at customer role, you know. Uh, when they apply as a player, though, uh, they gain access to the initiate role. Initiate role, uh, once they're approved as a member, basically lets them know, okay, they're here, but they need to be trained before they can go any further. As you know, we have a few unique mechanics when it comes to combat, magic, and we kind of realized, yeah, I think training people on this is certainly necessary rather than let experience teach them, you know? I can't believe it wasn't common sense in my head at the, when, when I first thought of it, you know? After training is completed, which is typically about 30 to 40 minutes or so, one time it was an hour because I kept going on a lore tangent because someone asked about lore. Uh, piece of advice, don't ask, me, don't ask me too much about the lore on certain topics during training. You will be there for longer. <laughs> um... <laughs> Yeah, once you're once you pass training, you become a novice, uh, and basically once you're trusted enough to go up to the next rank, you become apprentice. Then you'll become magus, and then once we have enough magus, we'll basically uh, open up training for high magus, which is basically the highest potential role a player can get, and the most powerful magic is locked behind high magus, because like a novice, because we still have our magic in the three tiers for balancing reasons. Uh, tier 1, you get a novice. Tier 2, you get an apprentice. But you only get tier 3 at high magus. Because we only want... Because tier 3 is like Jujutsu Kaisen level type bullshit, you know? <laughs> like, like, not, like, tier 1 is like cantrips and level 1, level 2 spells. Apprentice is like, maybe like level 3, level 4. High magus is Jujutsu Kaisen. I'm not even sure coding it. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> so, and we only want players we absolutely trust getting their hands on that shit. <laughs> That's like world ending type shit. <laughs> no, not exactly world ending, just street destroying if if used wrong. Fair. That's fair. I'm very I'm curious as to what exactly qualifies in in your eyes as a Jujutsu Kaisen like magic in that case. Definitely interested in that. So imagine a fireball that consumes everything a ten foot radius. Does that answer it? That, mm, that's pretty accurate, I guess. I feel like it'd be a little bit more grand scale, but ten I feet could be wrong. Uh, no, sorry, 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 not 10 feet, 10 meters. Oh, okay, that, that, yeah, that's, yeah. I mixed it up, I mixed it up in my head. 10 meters, yeah. Like, like, make you an explosion type shit, you know? That, that's more accurate. I was about to say, 10 feet's not that bad. Yeah, 10 meters, yeah. That's, I miss, yeah darn He's conversions <laughs> um i yeah uh freedom units be wilden hello everyone just want to interrupt the video right here uh if you'd like to support me on any of my um variety of content uh i do have a throne as well as a ko-fi so make sure you go check that out uh, i want to thank you all so much for watching let's get back into the video
so yeah, so that's uh, so that's essentially where the players can rank up to. So, is there any level above that, or is it just kind of locked at that uh, high Mangus point? For players, it's locked at high Mangus. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So, and then afterwards, what does it kind of go to after that? Like for the non-players per se, does that go into like the staff roles essentially? Pretty much. Although you can be, yeah, you can, yeah, words. You can still sort of like, yeah, above the players are just staff, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Don't yeah. overcomplicate the explanation. Just go leave it at that. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So, because I've been told I complicate things a lot. <laughs> It's okay. Role play is complicated, no matter what you look at. Um, so, 100%. <laughs> so out of curiosity, because we kind of went in depth with the name. So I'm, I've, I've been curious because you, you've shown me the logo a few times. So what was the, what was like the inspiration and the meaning behind the actual logo that you guys have? Uh, I actually provide a neat explanation in the very first channel players usually have access to. <clears throat> the Darnot. The Darnot is interconnected, influenced by roots of ancient oak trees of Ireland. The word Dara even came from the word Doyer, which means oak tree. Although a modern rendition, the symbol itself represents strength, wisdom, endurance, community, and immortality. The gods themselves were immortal. They were wise, they were strong, they stuck together. Although not gods, we the players, and as in the mages, are wise and just as strong. We are connected in a way we may not know, but we are all connected nonetheless. And each of the colors in the logo uh, represent a different discipline of magic. So, you know, we have, like, green for healer, uh, white for strength, it's like blue, uh, blue for strength, orange for illusionist, and white for uh, um, summoner. They also happen to be the four national colors of Ireland, too, and the colors of the four seasons spring, summer, fall, and winter. Huh, quadruple meaning, yeah, no, for real. Granted, was... the Irish, the, the national colors one was a coincidence, according to my brother. Uh, <laughs> when I showed him the logo, fair, yeah. I mean, I figured the green, white, and orange. I didn't know blue was one, though. That's a I didn't know that. Can can I get a casual? Yeah, that me like a truck, yeah, no. Um, Damn are you now? <laughs> but yeah, so so okay, that's that's actually very interesting. Um, so out of, out of curiosity, to kind of you know lighten it up a little bit, so you know you got these very what seem to be in depth events, just from what you've told me. So I guess one of my questions is, um, you know, what was like the funniest thing that's ever happened during one of your events? Oh, okay. Funniest thing that could have happened in an event. See, that, that that sounds like it would narrow it down. It would. But it doesn't. It, it really doesn't. Okay, think, 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 think. Um, think, 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 rain, think. Ah, okay. This thing happened literally just yesterday. So, every two weeks or so, we do social RPs. Uh, sometimes we're in the cafe, uh, but this week it was a beach episode, because, you know, summer party, you know, summer, beaches, you know? Uh, there was a moment where, like, my character, Deirdre, and another were, like, having an in-depth discussion about, about the metaverse and such, and how, technically, how horrifying that is from an existential standpoint, uh, and such. And then it gets... Politely interrupted by two plush dolls, because we have, like, literal possessed plush dolls and, like, Pinocchio-ass looking Liza P dolls as our race players can play as. So these two plush dolls walk up to us with drinks in hand, and they hand it to us. And the small uh, green one, uh, Lime, hands uh, Jesse, the person I was talking to, like, the character I was talking to, uh, an orange, like, alcohol drink. But then, like... Due to VR chat's physics being weird, they ended up grabbing the green one instead, and the orange one just went missing. And then we just started hyper fixating on that, and then we just burst. Out. <laughs> we just <laughs> like, we literally broke character so hard on that, but we somehow managed to keep it somewhat in character the whole time. And then we found the orange drink, and I was like, "Oh, hey, Jesse, there's your drink right there." And then it's like, "What do you mean?" It's like. <laughs> 
<laughs> Fair enough. So yeah, because I mean, another I, I, I oh. No, go ahead. I mean, if you want to hear another funny thing, go for it. <laughs> another funny thing that happened, uh, I think about three events ago, we were intercepting weapons uh, shipments from the cult we we're fighting at the moment. Uh, and at one point, the idea was, okay, one of our mages cast Gaslight, which pretty much like command from D&D. And the, and the command was simple. Uh, blow up that truck. But the thing was, the cultists, when they blew up the truck by stabbing the lithium ion battery beneath of their swords, when the truck blew up, so did the cultists. And when the illusionist mage, uh, Chris, stepped out in front of the trees to see the explosion, boom, much like Huey and the boys, a bunch of blood and limbs just fell on them, and it happened constantly during the event. It became a running gag, to be honest. Oh, oh, poor Chris, poor Chris. Poor, yeah, it sounds like it. No, it's definitely a uh, ouch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man. So let's get kind of more. Let's kind of get more in depth into like what you do, you know, because you founded the community. So you know, kind of like what what was like the stepping stones to getting from where you started to like today. So okay, so first I got. At the server, so first I made the server layout and such. That that was like a whole thing and a half. That's a that's a story too long for this podcast. Uh, <laughs> with some roadblocks along the way, road roadblocks, not Roblox, You gen of brain rotters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, Skibbity Riz. Um, Ohio Gian. No, um, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> anyways <laughs> yes yes yeah we had the server layout then i started writing up some basic lore figure out what year exactly it was originally going to be 2062 originally but then i settled on 2034 because i wanted to keep the technology not too cyberpunk but just like beginner cyberpunk like babies for cyberpunk like the limbs they're they're better enough like med medically speaking but you're not gonna see a fashion trend where you want to willingly replace your limb because at this moment in lore, you'd just be seen as an overall cunt for doing that, you know? You know? Like like if uh like if like if you wanted to do that today. Like if I want to go up to like a doctor and be like, hey, can you get rid of my limbs so I can have a Bluetooth speaker with a machine gun mounted to it, please? They'd say, Miss, shut the fuck up. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Why? You know? You'd only be able to get this shit if you're like in the military or in the black market. Like if you willingly want cyberware if when you already have the limb you need or something. The only acceptable cyberware at the moment are neural links, which people use to connect to the matrix, which is basically the net which people access via their minds and shit. Which hey, after World War Three, people go on that every day. Oh yeah, that's right, World War Three was a thing in our lore. That's a whole that's a whole thing. I'm not discussing that here. That is a whole thing and a half. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. So uh, funny, funny that you mentioned that it's 2034, right? Because in my mind, like, I, I, I want to let you continue, but I want to tangent on this for a second. So what happens if, like, further down the line, right, if presumably, you know, the community is still thriving and VR chat's still thriving. So what are the odds of, like, you know, potential when it comes, like, we make it to 2034, would you have to ch i would assume you would have to change like some things out of curiosity i mean yeah i mean the rp started out as 2033 because the rp was founded in 2023 i changed it to 2034 to match because when it comes to the dates it's pretty much this current date 10 years ahead combined with all the alternate timeline bullshit that happened in the background such as the fall of greece for example that's a whole thing and a half so in other words, so World War Three is going to happen within the next 10 years. Got it. Cool. Well, actually, in <laughs> Toy Fit Non's lore, it actually already happened in, from 2002 to 2005. Fair. Dang. I was going to I was going to make it yeah. like a, a Simpsons like, all right, so they're, they're predicting no, sorry, 2001. Exactly happened. 2001, sorry. Fair. 2001, sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah. But anyways, back to, back yeah. to what you're saying regarding the stepping stones. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, after after I built up the lore, I started recruiting for staff amongst my closest friends. You know, like Sammy, Potato, 
uh, one of our founding members, Tomori, who is cur- who uh, is no longer our, one of our staff. You know, you, know, you know, people come and go. You know, then we have Cappy, then we have Kara Sato. They all came on different stages, but what we have now is what we have. You know, and it was the biggest thing that took us the longest to do, and the main contributing factor to what took us the longest for the community is because our magic is very much like a bit of a skill tree if you want to visualize it that raw. Each discipline of magic has spells that only they have access to. Unless you're a summoner, in which case you're a greedy motherfucker and a jack of all trades. Um, I will get to, I'll explain with that, what I mean on that later. Because I, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, what, you're locked to certain spells, but you also have spells that all disciplines can use, so known as utility spells. So we had to figure out, okay, how do we make this work in VR chat? Can we make a modular avatar asset that makes it easy? And most of all, can we make it optimized? We did all of that. Not quest friendly, but we still did it. We even made, uh, we, I even like learned uh, Ogum script, uh, kind of, which is like the ancient Irish alphabet. It's like a vertical alphabet that goes like, I think from bottom to top of a, a vertical line, then you do different diagonal or cross lines to, to signify letters and stuff. And I made like, you know, little magical tattoo symbols, and they basically go on the uh, left or right hand, or in one player's case, the stomach of their character and such to show what discipline they are. (laughs) Yeah. So kind of to go back just for a second. um, So are you, is your community quest compatible or is it mainly PC side? It is PC only. I would have wished for it to be quest compatible, but realistically speaking, it, it it can't. It just can't. No, and that's fair. It's tragic, but yeah. No. You win some, you lose some. Exactly. And with, unfortunately, and this is something I see with a lot of uh, roleplay communities, unfortunately, when you, you, you do more work trying to do quest side than actual, like, roleplay itself when it comes down to it. And it's a, just unfortunately how it is sometimes. Yeah, so when it came to choosing between broader quest compatibility or making our spells look and feel cool to use we had to choose the latter a bit of a tough decision but you know it happens that's fair but yeah yeah I mean, definitely definitely a lot of definitely a lot of cool things from what i'm hearing um so out, out of curiosity um you know for kind of maybe people who are interested like how how does one join you know the role play like yeah i don't know why i said yeah that was a weird way of phrasing it how how does one join you know the role play uh well first of all we have um let's see we have one our vr chat legends page if you're any of you are aware of the vr chat legends wiki basically big ass wiki full of like well vr chat legends and such uh lots of groups use that to advertise and just uh, write stuff down in a sense. Uh, we have our Discord link in it, but you can also find our Discord link by looking up the group name, uh, you know, in VR chat. Or uh, will the group name be? Will the group link be included in the yeah. uh, in the description of the video? Oh, it'll it will? be put. It'll be put on. Yeah, any links will be in the description, and I'll put them on screen too. So. <laughs> Do you do QR codes too? Because I love QR codes. <laughs> uh, I can I can throw a QR code. That's fine. We'll just throw in the bottom corner over. Yeah, right QR there. codes are absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be yeah, the first. Like, yeah, but yeah, yeah, if you got QR yeah. codes, just send them to me. Um, I got a poster. I also oh, need a poster. Just later. Send, send me. Yeah, send me. Literally, when we're done, you can send me anything, everything. But. but yeah, of yeah. course. Um. No, it's and, definitely. You know, once you. Go ahead. Once you join the Discord, once you join the Discord, you know, you get your custom role, as I had said. Then you apply to become a member and such, and then you do training, and boom, you're in as a player or an NPC or just both, you know. So because you're NPCs, just saying. <laughs> Fair. I know a lot of role plays that are in that same boat. They could use more NPCs. So if you're one of those uh, NPC oh, yeah. role players, hit them up. Hit literally any role play can be up, but. Hit them up first. Um. <laughs> yeah, we we very much we, listen. We might not say it all the time, but you guys are our lifeblood. <laughs> fair, fair. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely 
definitely interesting kind of get to learn a little bit more about you. So, you know, now that we kind of got the, you know, community, you know, pretty much under wraps, um, I'm probably missing some details. It happens with every episode, but you know, make sure to go check out to if they didn't, I'm going to fucking butcher the name again. At this point, yeah, I'm going to get roasted in the comments. Go ahead and just do it. Anyway, but make sure to go check out uh, Toyota on, um and all their stuff. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about you, right? So, because you, you've done quite a bit, you know, when it comes to VR chat. So, like, kind of briefly, you know, kind of be, what, what else have you done besides, like, you know, the role play side of the VR chat? Um, I'm a VTuber. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not as active on Twitch as I would like to be because, uh, turns out running a community makes you, uh, fucking busy <laughs> as hell. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have tried to combat this by streaming myself RPing sometimes in different metaverse communities also, just to do something. Although I do have plans to start streaming uh, the new gotcha game, uh, Zenless. That one, yeah, I do want to stream that one. Because like I started off doing mostly like Valorant or VR chat streams. Then I just now I just do like mainly VR chat stuff most of the time or whatever else game I feel like playing. I'll probably stream the entire Yakuza franchise or like a dragon as it's known now. Mm -hmm. uh, once I get more time to do so, because I have like the first six, including Zero. I just need to buy Seven, Eight, Judgment, Judgment. Uh, two, and then like, uh, like a dragon guide. I just got those one and Ishin, and no, Dead Souls isn't on PC. <laughs> yeah, I love the Yakuza games. It's it's why I'm in, it's why I love coaching no Yakuza so much because it's got that vibe too. You know, shout out shout out to Ginger and Yuki like for maintaining such a cool vibe over there. You know, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you know, I, I guess one of the last questions I have for you. Um, so you, you guys were at project community. So out of, out of curiosity, um, you know, what was it like, you know, to be at an event like project community specifically? Um, I was at PGKT last year, actually, although this was back before I even fully knew what toy fit and was going to be back when it was just a simple design document. And I saw so many different types of communities at there last year. And obviously, it was a much smaller scale than what we saw this year. Because, like, holy shit, <laughs> you, the, the size difference. I can vividly remember, like, maybe 20, 30 booths max last year. No, there must have been, like, 50, close to 100 this year or something. Who so, knows? There was, 50, uh, like a lot. there was 54 last year and 108 this year. Or 107. I might have my number wrong. It's holy 107, 108. So we, we did double. Holy shit. Yeah. God damn, damn, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I was I I was personally invited into PJKT by uh Yuki, uh although back then I wasn't a community representative in like officially in PJKT. I was merely invited for photo shoots for the Christmas one. I'm not. I don't remember if you were there for the Christmas photo shoots or not. I was not. But I was. I think you might definitely remember the. Yeah, but like there's plenty of good photos of there of me and some of my staff there just chilling, having fun. Uh. Then I was involved in some other photo shoots. I don't remember which ones they were. I think it was Valentine's Day for one of them. I, I need to mm -hmm. actually see if I was in, in any of those. But like, yeah, then I became representative. Then it just became a waiting game, waiting for the main event, updating my staff anytime the, the date of the convention was changed, which that became a constant at one point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but hey, hey, at least I got more time to actually make the booth. And just like the biggest... The, the big scale of like PJKT this year was like, it was really, uh, well, I needed avatar calling. That was no exaggeration. I needed it. But I also met a ton of cool people. Like, for example, I met uh, Steve Mitochondriac uh, there. The one, yeah. I, I, their assets are so cool. And they're so fun to hang out with, too. I got to try out their bike. Did you have, did you have their bike, too? I, th I think you were there, right? Yeah, there, there's, there's some pictures yeah, of are, me on are. the bike. Yeah, there's some pictures of me on the bike. It is, it is legendary. Yeah. <laughs> There's a picture of me on the bike, too. I'll send you that so you can show it on screen if you want or something, right? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you that picture, like, later or something. It was so funny. Um, but, like, yeah, it was super fun. I even got to meet some of the folks from the different Warhammer communities, which is perfect timing, because I just got into Warhammer myself, actually. Well, as much as my wallet hates that. Uh, <laughs> I went from a balance of 237 back down to 71 cents. Yeah, that sounds right. 
that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Worth it though. Worth it though. They're fun as hell to build on paint. Um, but yeah, just it was really fun hanging around with people, being introduced to so many communities, uh, all that stuff. Even the little interview that was streamed on Twitch and such. It was like so cool. I must have that like preamble advertisement that I do for Talitha like in the back of my head now, just like ready to recite like a sleeper agent, like with Lil John and this galvanized square of steel, you know? Fair enough. No, I mean that's it, it happens with most creators, whether it's role play, content, or anything, it just kind of becomes second nature. Um, at least that's something I've yeah, pretty much. Um, well, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to first and foremost, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast and introducing me into you know yeah. Toyota Data Non. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's really cool to get some insight in regards to different types of role play communities, which is one of the reasons why I'm so glad to have you guys on. Um, so real quick before, you know, we, you know, cut it off, I do want to give you the chance, um, you know, to plug any links, uh, anything that you're working on, uh, anything like that, but the floor is yours and t feel free to take it away. Well, as I said, I stream on Twitch. Uh, there's no exact day I stream on Twitch. I just stream when I'm able to, but I am trying to find a schedule and such. I also do avatar setup commissions where... Much like, uh, like basically, like if you have assets that you bought for an avatar, but you realized Unity is a bit too hard for you to work with, you just send the assets over onto me. I put them together for you. I kit bash them together, like building a car, like building a Subaru out of a Ferrari or something. That kind of logic here, uh, and then just you know, offer the low price of a of a base price of twenty five euros and such. Already got two clients. I made the postal guy and an emo fox boy. That's not a joke. I made the fox boy. I, I made the postal guy using that exact. No wait. Are you using Minase or uh, Maki? Minase, yeah. That I made the postal guy with Maki. That's not a joke. He literally has the whole jacket and everything. <laughs> and he's gonna be a goddamn character in my community too. And I'm like so excited to see what that happens. <laughs> I regret <even> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, low price at twenty five euros. You can find him on Ko-Fi. More details and such. Or you can just like yeah. Yeah, shameless plug done. Woo! What, uh, you want to plug your community links too while you're at it? Uh, yeah, yeah. The Twitch and non link. You can like show it on screen because it's not. It it doesn't have that fancy like Discord Nitro link. Yeah, I I don't have that many boosts yet. So you can just right down here, editor uh, Chan Kun San thing. Yeah, right down here, right <laughs> below my likes. <laughs> <laughs> or up above my head, if, if, if there's more space. Or oh. even uh, right on Novit's face. You can put, like, <laughs> do a Mike Wazowski on him with a QR code. Wow, okay, I see how it is. All right, <laughs> well, right. it was- <laughs> You're good, fam. It was, it was lovely to have you on. Um, so thank you once yeah. again for coming on. Um, but with that, ladies and gentlemen, everybody inside and outside the ballpark, this is it for episode 22 of the Nova Notes podcast. Um, yeah, I will say, you know, if you enjoyed the episode, make sure to, you know, leave a comment down below, you know, maybe ask Rain some questions in the comment section, you know, regarding the community and the role play, you know, maybe hit that like button. And if you're coming back to check out some of the other episodes, feel free to hit that subscribe button. <laughs> Because why not? You're already coming back anyway. But with all that said and done, I want to thank you all so much for watching. And I will see you in the next episode. Take care and peace.